Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> I'm also well, thank you. I hope that you guys had a great long weekend. That is good to hear. Yes, I agree. It was totally too short. So let's wait another minute or two and see if more people will join us. So have you guys attempted the quiz? I'm sure you guys will do great in a quiz. You have a week to do it. Yes, it's on everything we have done this far. And have you guys started with your moon assignment? Just a heads up to not underestimate the assignment. So, a message I received on the uh, WhatsApp group today. I'm going to read the question and then answer it. So from tomorrow till 20, so from tomorrow till August 22 this year, it will be colder than previous years. They call it a Pelion phenomenon. Starting tomorrow at 5:27 a.m., we will experience the Pelion phenomenon, where the Earth will be very far from the Sun. We cannot see the phenomena, but we can feel its impact. This will last until August 2022. We will experience cold weather more than a previous cold weather, which will have the impact on flu, cough, shortness of breath, etc. Therefore, let's all increase immunity by drinking lots of vitamins and supplements so that our immunity is strong. The distance from Earth to the Sun is five light minutes or 90,000 kilometers. The phenomenon of Apelian is 152,000 kilometers and is this 66% further. So the question is, is this true or false? So this is completely, completely, completely false. So I see this is a new hoax that started to pop up. So this is the second time this year I've seen this hoax. So you will realize every year, a single time, the same hoaxes pop up and this information pops up 
it happens. But this is a new one that is starting to happen. So why do people make up hoaxes? So they read something and then they add another tail to it and everything gets blown out of proportion and each year at the same time this will start happening again and again and again so just to make sure this message said that we are 66,000 kilometers from the sun. If that was the case, we would all be dead. We are on an average 155 kilometers, 155,000 kilometers from the sun. Meaning that differs depending on where we are, Apelian or Perihelion. But the closest approach is 144, 148,000, and the furthest approach is 152,000. So there's a bird of a play, but the average constantly is 150,000 kilometers, and that is the definition of the astronomical unit. So, and what causes seasons is the cant of the Earth at roughly 21 degrees. So this is completely ho hoax and false information. One thing that it makes this year and last year the weather patterns a little bit different is because we are in currently in a El Nino effect. Are you guys familiar with the El Nino effect? So in the last roughly 10 years, we were in an El Nino effect. The El Nino effect is regarded to with abnormal low rainfall and the opposite El Nino or La Nina, ah, sorry, it's not El Nino, it's La Nina, is abnormal high rainfall. So that will mean our winters will be a little bit cooler and summers will also be a little bit cooler and that is why we are now experiencing heavy rainfalls weird rainfalls and much cooler temperatures since uh, last year so that depends on a few factors so basically the last eight to ten years we were in uh, our Nino effect um, so that's why we had this drought and may um, add more heat waves. But now we are in the complete opposite. So we are now in the El, El Nino, yeah, the La Nina effect. So um, you guys can read up about it more to get understanding of what it is. And this actually brings up a topic that is sort of a pet peeve to me. So one thing I'm involved with also the last couple of years is science communication and science outreach to get the general public more interested in science and to get a general understanding of science and what everything happens and how everything fits together and just to make sure that these hoaxes doesn't get spread and isn't misinformation and with the COVID-19 pandemic that has become even worse so meaning is i've seen there's now a lot of ignorant people that state information they have no clue about so from this module even if you decide you're not going to pursue astronomy even if you decide you are not going to pursue science at all and go to a corporate environment that's 100 percent. that's fine but there is a few things from the scores at least that I want you to think about and to take home and ponder a bit on it. The first thing is, and I'll say this many times, 
if you want to do great things in science and even in technology, move away from Windows. That's the first thing. So I told you there's going to be a lot of Windows bashing in my glasses. And then the second thing is don't be ignorant towards science. Don't let religion, political influence, or anything else dictate what happens in science. It's like the quote of Neil deGrasse Tyson that says, science is true whether you believe in it or not. And stick to it. Don't let anything decide or influence science facts. Um, I can continue on about this for ages, but that is one thing I want you to take home. So I see here a link. Is this true? So let me open up this link. Uh, so, not a good sign. The temperature was 70 degrees above average near South Pole, a troubling record. So, that is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, that is true. That is uh, due to the fact of global warming. So, I don't think 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a bit much. And I think that's a bit exaggerated. But, yeah, that is true. And Twitter is the enemy to everyone. Yes, that is true. And Twitter is the enemy of science, unfortunately. And then what's wrong with Windows? So unfortunately, from the 80s, uh, Windows got a nice graphical interface going and most people stuck with Windows. But if you are doing proper engineering, proper science, then you don't use Windows. Then Windows is not suited for those kind of tasks. Yes, there are certain tasks you have to use Windows for, but in science and technology and engineering careers, that is not used. Um, so that is the point. So one thing is, you can take a few of the Linux machines. So Linux is very customizable, very stable, and you can optimize Linux extremely. The same with the Mac operating system. So most people will say, and think about this, that says, yes, but for the price of a Mac, you can get a machine with much, much better specs. That is true, but a Mac with lower specs will run circles around a machine that's running Windows with higher specs. And the main reason, therefore, is Windows is not optimized. So Windows needs to run on 90% of hardware configurations. So if you have your CPU, GPU, motherboard, RAM, it caters for all brands, it will work. But with that approach, it means Windows' operating system is not optimized. So take Mac, for example. Some of you have probably heard of a Mac and a Hackintosh. So if you build your own PC but want to run uh, Mac OS on it. The problem, therefore, is if you want to build a Hackintosh, you need specific hardware out of specific patches. And that is why Apple takes tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of time and effort to optimize their software to work with certain hardware. So now you have hardware that's not top spec, but it will run circles around top spec hardware just because the software is optimized. And the same goes towards Linux. If you put time and effort into it, then yes, you will run circles around any Windows machine. So Windows PCs are hands down the best for gaming. Yes, so that's unfortunately most games or 90% of games are designed for Windows. So if you want to do gaming, yes, then Windows is your only option. So which is why I never particularly thought of swapping. Linux is way faster off the game devs just forget it exists. Yes, unfortunately that is true, but hopefully with Steam Deck that is changing. So that's just one thing in mind. So I can continue on for this 
for hours and hours and hours, especially when external factors creeps in on science such as religion politics but let's leave this conversation for now so in last week's lecture we discussed the sun and i showed you two videos of how our the size of our sun compares to different stars and we also showed you a video of the spectrum of the sun and now we're going to look at the family of stars. But before we begin with the family of stars, there are two quick videos I want to show you guys. nuclear reactor is a stressful task. There's a lot on the line if a mistake is made or if there is a malfunction. And so today we're doing the top five amazing nuclear reactor starts. So that is pretty cool, right? So after our discussion of nuclear reactors last week, I thought I would show you this video. So I hope you guys noticed the control rods and the fuel rods moving in and out of each other to control the reaction. And that blue light you see around the reactor is called the Shunikov radiation. And that is due to charged particles traveling at a speed of light or faster than the speed of light through that specific medium. So I don't know if you guys watched the series Chernobyl. 
And that eerie blue glow you saw in the night sky above the reactor, that was Chernikov radiation. And that static you're hearing is just the electronics around the reactor. And then now for the second video I want to show you guys. The Allegheny Mountains in West Virginia is this, the Green Bank Radio Telescope, the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. Now, if you're building an optical telescope, something that looks at the stars, then you want to be on top of a mountain. You want to get through as much of Earth's atmosphere as you can. But a radio telescope needs to be isolated from all the radio noise that humanity produces. Now, one way is to build it in the middle of a load of mountains. Solid rock does a pretty good job of shielding. But another way is to get everyone around you to just shut up. Welcome to the National Radio Quiet Zone. Uh, this is where I would have used a big sweeping drone shot to get the dramatic picture, but um, remote control isn't allowed here. The job of the Green Bank Telescope is actually really, really flexible from looking at objects in the solar system to looking at objects halfway across the universe and further. It was instrumental in uncovering the molten core of Mercury. It helped to resolve a sort of controversy in astronomy about the distance to a nearby star cluster. And that might sound a little bit mundane, but measuring distances in astronomy is very hard. And one of the biggest projects that the telescope does right now is also looking for living things out there in space. It's called the Breakthrough Listen Project, and it's a search for extraterrestrial intelligence using the Green Bank Telescope and other facilities like it throughout the world. The quiet zone is roughly a rectangle, about 100 miles on each side. And since 1958, the US government has put strict limits on transmissions within the zone, partly for this telescope and partly because of a much more secure military facility 30 miles away that uh, listen to more earthly communications. Some folks writing about the quiet zone, they say that all transmissions are banned for the whole 100 miles, but that's not true. There are cities within the wider parts of the zone and the folks there happily use Wi-Fi and cell phones. It's the quiet zone, not the silent zone. Out there, the rules are about big transmitters, the kind that put out TV and radio signals. They're required to use low power directional antennas rather than just spraying signal everywhere. Within 10 miles of here though, the rules start becoming a bit more strict. This telescope is sensitive enough that if it was pointed the right way, it could pick up a signal with the equivalent energy of one snowflake hitting the ground. And even if it's not pointed right at you, it's got two acres of surface area to hear your phone screaming for cell towers that just aren't there. Living in a place without a cell phone is definitely an interesting change. Uh, you know, before two years ago, I did have a cell phone, could look up anything I wanted on Google. You know, after a week of living here, I didn't even really notice it. The only difference is, is that you have to plan things ahead more. If you want to meet up with your friends, you plan in advance, or you just say, yeah, I'll meet up with them when I meet up with them, uh, things like that. And many, many people have come and gone, stayed for weeks or months at a time, and really none of them have ever said, man, I really miss my cell phone. In the nearby town of Greenbank, anything that transmits, whether that's baby monitors or wireless doorbells, is banned. So is anything that might cause interference. Microwave ovens aren't allowed. Power lines have to be buried four feet underground. The observatory buildings near the telescope are huge Faraday cages, keeping all the emissions inside. So this is the anechoic chamber that I test in. I first test the device itself to see what the emissions are, then design a box for it put it back in the chamber and see if I did a good job or not. Things like uh, cameras, for instance, need to see high frequency electromagnetic energy, namely light, and yet we're trying to keep them from emitting lower frequency electromagnetic energy. Usually we use a, a mesh embedded in glass that's very fine and so it doesn't distort the image too much. Once you're within a mile of the telescope, the restrictions are so severe that only diesel cars are allowed. Regular gasoline cars, they cause too much interference from the spark plugs inside. Folks who say they're hypersensitive to electromagnetic fields move to this area. And even if pretty much all the evidence says it's in their heads, 
they still feel better for being here. The scientists, however, have more practical concerns. Mostly my work here deals with radio frequency interference uh, on site and also doing like routine runs to see if there's anything new out there. We have a monitoring uh, station down on site and then we'll jump in the truck and we have direction finding equipment in the truck. We just basically have to look at it with the receiver or the spectrum analyzer and, and just drive around and, and watch the signal peak or fall away. It is getting more difficult because because there's more and more wireless stuff out there. The wireless genie is out of the bottle. Uh, and there's so many things out there. The, the Internet of Things is, is creeping into almost every device. Refrigerators now have hotspots in them. When we go around and, and scan for Wi-Fi hotspots, there's, there's always like three or four printers out there. The strangest one I've heard of was a, an electric pad in a doghouse. There was some arcing inside the pad, and it was generating a lot of RFI. So uh, my predecessor is the one that found that one, and and they they fixed it by uh, buying the guy a new heater for the doghouse. Thank you to everyone at the Green Bank Observatory and all the staff at the Radio Telescope. I am kind of overwhelmed to be up here. I am so grateful to all of them. Please pull down the description, check out the links, and go see what they do. So that is just something else interesting from the Green Bank Observatory. <clears throat> so let's start off with tonight's lecture. So like I said, tonight we're going to start looking at the different stars and the family of stars. So we are going to discuss the family of stars, star distances, apparent brightness, intrinsic brightness and luminosity, stellar spectra, star masses, star masses in binary stars, and then the senses of the stars. So here we can see in this image, this single pixel right here is the size of our sun and this is how big stars can become in the universe so you guys remember the video i showed you last week great So to discover the properties of stars, astronomers use telescopes and instruments, such as photometers, cameras, and spectrographs, in clever ways to learn the secrets hidden in starlight. The result is a family portrait of the stars. Knowing the distances to the stars is the key to knowing most of their other properties. But measuring those distances is very difficult. In this lecture, we are going to discuss five important questions. How far away are the stars? How much energy do stars make? How do spectra of stars allow you to determine their temperatures? How big are the stars? And how much mass do stars contain? Do you guys recognize this quote? To boldly go where no man has gone before. No. This is from one of the best Star Trek series. The Star Trek series, one of the best sci fi franchises whatsoever. So remember the Starship Enterprise, to boldly go where no man has gone before, and this has been redone now to say it's to boldly go where no one has gone before. Where are all the trackies in the audience? <laughs> Star Wars fans, I understand. To 
Shakespeare compared love to a star that can be seen easily and even used for guidance, but whose the real nature is utterly unknown. He lived at about the same time as Galileo and had no idea what stars actually are. To understand the history of the universe, the origin of Earth and your place in the cosmos, you need to discover what people in Shakespeare's time did not know, the real nature of stars. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to find out what stars is like. When you look at a star, even through a large telescope, you see only a point of light. The real understanding of stars requires careful analysis of starlight. So I want to ask you guys, how would we determine the distance to stars? Any ideas? Okay, top left effect. So what sort of stars? So any star in space, how would we, if you look up in a night sky, you pick a star, how would you determine a distance to it? So yes, approximation is a way. So red, blue light shift. So yes, we use the red or blue shift to determine if it's moving towards us or away from us. That is basically the Doppler effect. So yes, the luminosity is correct. So triangulation, yes, you can use a certain form of triangulation. Then color composition grid shift calculation, yes, you can use that. And then Mr. Melville, yes, parallax. So you guys are all correct, but to find out almost anything about a star, you must know how far away it is. Although, Knowing distances is crucial. It is also the most difficult measurement in astronomy. Astronomers have found numerous ways to estimate the distance to stars, but each of those ways ultimately depends on a direct geometrical method that is much like the method of surveyors. Used to measure the distance across a river they cannot cross. So this is how surveyors will do it. So you can find a distance, uh, where's my pointer? So you can find a distance D across a river by measuring the length of the baseline and the angles A and B, then construct the scale drawing of the triangle or you and use trigonometry to calculate it. So here we have the, this we want a distance to point C. So here we have our line across, that's the distance we want. So here we have a baseband doing this side, baseband going that side. So from here to that point, we know what this distance is. We can measure the angle, we know what this angle is. So let me get the marker out. Let's get a color. So we can use this angle. We can use this angle. We use this distance and this distance and then from basic trigonometry we can calculate our distance d and that is how surveyors calculate distance so but we then have to know the diameter of the star to use this method so not need to know the diameter of the star so this is where things becomes really cool so for star our distances, we use the concept called parallax that we have discussed in previous chapters as well. So with parallax, we know that we want the distance to this star. So here is the sun. So it's the distance is always from the sun to the object we are observing. So here we have this, this distance d. So here we have our one baseband. So that is when Earth is on the one side of the sun and six months later the Earth's other side of the sun. And we know that distance is one AU or one astronomical unit. So here we have our, our baseband, here we have our other baseband. And then we use this angle over here called the parallax angle. And then again, from basic trigonometry, 
we can then calculate the distance to that object. Is everyone following? So, yes. So, because the stars are so distant, the parallaxes are very small angles, usually expressed in arc seconds. Astronomers conventionally call stellar parallax the shift of the star observed across one AU. So, not two AU, a baseband is one AU. Astronomers measure the parallax, and surveyors measure the angles at the ends of the baseline. But both measurements reveal the same thing. The shape and size of the triangle and this distance to the object in question. The distances to stars are so large that astronomers have to find a special unit of distance, the parsec, for use in distance calculations. So you all remember from our second lecture, the definition of a parsec, right? So I know there's still a bit of confusion about this. So let me show you another video of the derivation of the parsec and hopefully that will explain it a little bit better than I explained it. So let me show you the video. Parsec was in the 1974 classic Star Wars A New Hope. You've never heard of the Millennium Fault? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. When I first heard that quote, I thought parsec was a unit of time, like a second or a minute. However, as I started to learn more about physics and astronomy, I learned that parsec was actually a unit of distance. To be precise, a parsec is a distance light travels in 3.26 years, or in more everyday units, it's something like 31 trillion kilometers or 19 trillion miles. When studying the universe, it's very useful to have a unit like the parsec because distances between celestial objects are so great that units like kilometers and miles just aren't that helpful to us. Imagine trying to quantify the distance between the Earth and the Sun in centimeters or the distance between the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy in miles. It just wouldn't really be that helpful. But how exactly did astronomers define a parsec? The technical definition is the distance at which one astronomical unit subtends an angle of one arc second. Let's try and understand what this means. Okay, so let's get into how astronomers defined a parsec exactly. Now I've written out the definition again, which is the distance at which an astronomical unit subtends an angle of one arc second. And let's go ahead and define what an astronomical unit and an arc second are. So an astronomical unit, or an AU, is just the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun, and I've written out what it is in kilometers there. And an arc second, or arc sec for short, is simply 1 over 3,600 of 1 degree. So you need 3,600 arc seconds in 1 degree. If you recall, if you think to a circle, a circle has 360 degrees in it. So it has quite a bit of arc seconds in it as well. Now what I want to do is introduce this concept known as parallax. Parallax is going to be extremely useful when defining what a parsec is. So parallax is the phenomenon where a nearby object will appear to shift position with respect to more distant objects. One easy thing you can do is stick out your finger, hold it still, and then close one of your eyes. And then shift which eye you have open and which eye you have closed. And if you keep doing this, you'll notice that your finger appears to shift position relative to whatever is behind it. And this technique of parallax is a common technique in astronomy that is used to estimate distances to distant objects like stars. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a picture that I've drawn here. And it's a picture of the Earth going around the sun and a star that is the star that we're going to be looking at in question and how 
if we think about the Earth and how it orbits around um, the sun in a year, if we take the Earth at its longest distance from each other, so six months apart from each other, so we're going from June to December here, and we can think about these two different points as sort of my eyes in the example where I did with the, with the finger, because it, we're changing our perspective um, to the star at different points of the year, and because there are farther more distant background stars, the star that is closer to us is going to appear to shift position. So I'm just going to draw some lines here to get our perspective or the, the distance between the Earth and the star uh, at different times of the year. I'm also going to draw the distance between the sun and that star. It's not a perfect, it's not a perfect straight line, but it'll it'll do. And so let's define an angle P here, P as the parallax angle. So P we're going to say is the parallax angle, parallax angle. And let's call this part here D. Okay, and this is just the distance between the sun and the star. But here is the, here is sort of the punchline of what a parsec is. So the parsec, like we said before, is if we go back to the definition, the distance at which an astronomical unit subtends an angle of one arc second. So here we have an astronomical unit, and here is an angle that it's subtending between the star and the Earth. And the definition of, par of a parsec says at this uh, distance, this angle here, if it's one arc second, if P is one arc second, then D is defined to be a parsec. So let's just write that out. So if P equals one arc second, D is equal to one parsec. That's what it means. Essentially, if we think about parsec, P, so here's parsec, we can think of P as parallax angle, and then arcsec as arc second. So a parsec is, or the parallax angle is one arc second. One final thing that I want to address is how many astronomical units are in one parsec. Now, I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to show you how you derive it. So the answer to this question is there are 206, 265 AU, just about, in one parsec. And when I say just about, I mean the technical answer, it's 206, 264.8, I believe. But 206, 265 is a number that is constantly drilled into our heads when we study astronomy. So I'm going to show you how you get this number. So what we're going to do here is we're going to draw the triangle here that we had between the Earth, uh, the Sun, and that star. So we had P for the parallax angle, we had D here for the distance, which was one parsec um, in the example, and we have one AU down there. And so what are we going to do here? Well, we know that we know that uh, from trigonometry, that tangent of P is equal to opposite, is equal to 1 AU divided by D. Okay, and I'm going to show you that when P, so when P equals 1 arc second, D is equal to 206, 265 AU. That's what we're going to show. So let's use the small angle approximation. Small angle approximation. What that means is that tangent of theta is approximately sine of theta, which is approximately theta. And this is valid for theta that are less than, oh, let's say 10 degrees. And remember what we said, at one arc second is, or sorry, I should say that there are 3,600 arc seconds in one degree. So um, one arc second is definitely within the small angle approximation. And so we can do um, this thing where we're just going to make tangent of P equal to P, because that's just what the small angle approximation tells us to do. And this is equal to one AU divided by D. And now we set P equal to one arc second.
Now, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to, before, I'm, before I do that actually, let me just rearrange this so we'll have D on the left and P on the right. So we'll have D is equal to 1AU over P. Now the problem is that P is actually in unit, has units of arc second, and we want to have something that doesn't have any units. We want a non-dimensional unit. Uh, and for an angle, a non-dimensional unit is a radian. So radians technically don't have any units, and we want to keep this D here in units of astronomical unit. So what I'm going to do here is convert one arc second into radians, because it doesn't have any um, units in that case we want to keep it in astronomical units. So how do we do that? So I said one arc second, there are 3,600 arc seconds in one degree. And if we recall, there are 360 degrees in a circle. But in radians, that is 2 pi radians. And so if we cancel out the units here, so arc seconds cancels out with arc seconds, degrees cancels out with degrees, we're going to be left with 2 pi over 3600 times 360. In fractional form, it's going to be pi over 648,000, so pi over 648,000. and what, what that means is that we're going to have D is equal to 1 AU divided by pi over 6 or 8,000. And if we just recall that if we divide by a fraction, we just get the, the reciprocal. It's equal to 6 or 648,000 divided by pi AU. And what is that? Let's just do the math here. Six four 648000 divided by pi, and we get 206264.8, which will round up to 206265 astronomical units. Let me, let me draw that a little, bit, a little bit better. At the beginning of this video, I told you guys that a parsec is also 3.26 light years. And what I want to do now is show you that result based on what we found with the relationship between parsecs and astronomical units. So what we want to do is we want to convert parsecs into light years. Okay? And we want to show that one parsec is going to be equal to 3.26 light years. So we're going to need to do a number of conversions. What I'm going to do is let's find what a light year is in kilometers. And also, let's just put quote here. We're going to say the same exact thing. Parsec is in kilometers. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the... Um, we're going to take, we're going to figure out how many light years are in a parsec. Okay, so let's do that here. So one light year in kilometers. How do we figure out what that is? Well, we know that the speed of light is 299792 kilometers per second. I just have that memorized. And we want to figure out how many kilometers this is. So we need to multiply by a unit that has seconds. So how many seconds are there in a year? Well, we know there are 365 days. And in a year, I know technically there's 365.25. Um, but let's just go with 365. I don't think it will mess up the calculation at all. What we're going to do now is we're going to need to figure out how many seconds there are in a day. Uh, thankfully, I just know that there are 86,400 seconds in one day. That's just a number I've kept in the back of my mind. And you get this number by taking 24 hours in a day. And or one way you can think about it is that there's 3,600 seconds in an hour, and there's 24 hours in a day. So 3,600 times 24 gives you 86,400. OK, so this will convert um, 365 days 
into seconds. So let's just do the math here. Let's just multiply this all out. 2, not, two nine nine seven nine two times 365 times 864. Okay, so we have here, we have that one light year in kilometers is 9.45 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. And what about a parsec? So one parsec in kilometers is what now? Well, we know that above I wrote down what an AU is in in kilometers, and we figure out there are 206.265 AUs in a parsec. So why don't we go ahead and just use that fact? So so let's convert here. So one parsec is equal to 206.265 astronomical units, but we know that in one astronomical unit there are 1.496 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. I just want to double check one more time. Let's go all the way back up. Yep, that's correct. And here we go. So let's cancel out the AUs. And what does this give us? We have 206.265 times 1.496 times 10 to the 8. And this gives us 3.08 times 10 to the 13 kilometers. So finally, to calculate how many light years there are in a parsec, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this value, which is the distance of a parsec in kilometers, and this value, which is the distance of a light year in kilometers, and I'm going to take this number here and divide it by that number there. So we'll have 3.08 times 10 to the 13 kilometers divided by 9.45 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. And what are we going to get? So we divide this by 9.45 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. And what you know, we get 3.26. And so this tells us there are 3.26 light years in one parsec. Okay, there you go, guys. I hope you have learned a lot about what the Parsec is from this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know what you thought about the video, and let me know what else you'd like to know about astronomy um, that I could possibly make a video about. So have a good one, everybody. So hopefully that described a little bit better what a parsec is. So no, you don't need to know any of this math for testing exams. So I also believe you don't need to know a derivation by heart. If you've seen a derivation, you've seen derivation, just need, just need to know where to practice it and um, where and how to use it. But this should explain better what a arc second is and what a parsec is. So are you guys happy with this? So, so it would take a full six months to accurately measure the distance between Earth and a distant star. Yes, that is correct. It would take exactly six months apart. Okay, so hopefully everybody now understands parsec. So because stars are so distant, their parallaxes are very small angles, usually expressed in arc seconds. Astronomers con conventionally call stellar parallax the shift of the star observed across one AU, so not to a, U, a one AU baseline. Astronomers measure the parallax and surveyors measure the angles at the ends of the baseline. But both measurements reveal the same thing the shape and size of the triangle and thus the distance to the object in question. The distance to stars are so large that astronomers have defined a special unit of distance, the parsec, for use in distance calculation. The visible star nearest the sun, Alpha Centauri, so I will show it in the following figure and you will also see it in um, a list in the textbook, 
This approx uh, it has approximately a parallax of 0 0.747 arc second. And the more distant stars have even smaller angles. So to see how small these angles are, hold a piece of paper edgewise at arm's length. The thickness of the paper covers an angle of about 30 arc seconds. So reasoning with numbers. So this is the calculations I will ask you to do for using Parsec. So let's go through this example. To find distances to a star from its measured parallax, astronomers use the same calculation you have already seen in a small angle formula. So reasoning with numbers 3.1. Imagine that you observe our solar system from the star. So in figure 8.2 in the textbook shows you the figure, shows the angular separation. You would measure between the sun and earth equals the star's parallax. Recall that a small angle formula relates an object's angular diameter, its linear diameter, and its distance. In this case, the angular diameter is the parallax angle P, and the linear diameter, the base of the triangle, is 1 AU. Then the small angle formula rearranged slightly tells you that the distance d to the star in AU is equal to 2.06 times 10 to the power 5 divided by parallax and arc seconds. Mm. So the constant 2.06 times 10 to the power 5 is conversion factor, so the number of arc seconds in a radian. So this is the formula that you guys will just use and plug and play. So because the parallax of even the nearest stars are less than one arc second, the distances in AU are inconveniently large numbers. To keep the numbers manageable, astronomers have to find a parsec as the primary unit of distance in a way that simplifies their rhythmic. One parsec equals 2.06 times 10 to the power of 5 AU. So the equation becomes then you use this equation. So this parsec is distance to imaginary star whose parallax is one arc second. So the example, the star Altair has a parallax of 0 0.195 arc second. How far is it away? So what we do is we take this formula, we plug in our arc seconds, and there we get it. It's 5.13 parsec away. So one parsec equals 3.26 light years. So Take this conversion and we find out the star is 16.7 light years away. Everybody happy? Awesome. So the blurring caused by Earth's atmosphere smears stars' images and makes them about one arc second in diameter, even at a good observatory site, and that makes it difficult to measure parallax from Earth. Even when astronomers average together many observations, they cannot measure parallax from an observatory on Earth with an uncertainty smaller than about 0.002 arc second. Therefore, if we measure parallax of 0.02 arc second from Earth, the uncertainty is about 10%. So, how do we do this? How do we eliminate the atmosphere? We have two satellites in orbit, or not really satellites, telescopes in orbit, that is used to calculate distances to stars. So the first one was Hippocus. Um, it was from 89 to 93, weighed 500 kilograms, and it calculated the distance of 100,000 stars with accuracy of 2 milli arc seconds. Then we had Gaia in, from 2013 to 2018. He weighed more, just a little bit more than 2 tons. It calculated the position of uh, 1 billion stars and a radial velocity of 150 million stars with a accuracy of 24 micro arc seconds.
So now we're going to talk about the apparent brightness, intrinsic brightness, and luminosity of stars, and why that is important. So if you see a light on a dark highway, it is hard to tell how powerful it really is. Could it be a brilliant headlight on a distant truck, or a dim headlight on a nearby bicycle? So, to judge the true brightness of a light source, you need to know how far away it is. The headlight on a distant truck might appear as bright as the light on a nearby bicycle, giving you no clue about their real distances. So this is quite an important figure. So if you remember from high school, this is the flux density. So when we are closer to the source, you can call it, let's say, let me get uh, something out to mark with. We can add these different lines and more of these lines crossing a surface, the higher flux, the higher flux density it is. So this surface here will have a higher flux density of the surface here, but it follows the inverse square rule. So if this surface is, is two times the distance away, the flux will be a quarter of the original one. So that, does everyone understand? Okay, so let me get the whiteboard out. That will inverse. So this basically comes down to the inverse square law. So uh, this is a bit too thick. So let me just change this. So we want this. We want just the smallest. Yes. So the inverse square law is 1 over r squared. And we know if we have a, let's say this is our light source, and uh, this is our surface. So the flux is how much, for example, if it's a light source, light will penetrate this surface. And that is basically the Sweden short definition of flux density. But let's say, for example, we use this. And let's say for this example, this is, let's keep it red. So let's say this is, for example, we are one meter away. So we plug it in. So that is one over one squared. So that is one over one. And that means we are basically one. So let's do this experiment again. Now we have the same surface area, but that is now two meters away. So now let's continue on with this. So this misses it. This goes through, this goes through, this goes through, and that one misses it again. So if we plug this into our equation, we have one over 2 squared, and that equals 1 over 4. So that means that is our flux density is now 0 0.25. So what that means is our flux density is now smaller because we are further away. Does everyone understand this explanation? So this is just for the example. So yeah, I made up a number and say with the surface area is one meter away, and now the surface area is two meters away. 
So just remember the inverse square rule. So 1 over r squared. So let's go back to the slides. And that is basically what is happening here. Here of our light source, so here is our area. And here's our area at twice the distance. So it's a quarter of it. So how bright an object appears depends not only on how much light it emits, but also on its distance from you. The six magnitude star just visible to your eye looks faint but its apparent magnitude doesn't tell you how luminous it really is. Now that you know how to find a distance to stars, you can use those distances to figure out the intrinsic brightness of the stars. So intrinsic means belonging to the thing. So the intrinsic brightness of a star refers to the total amount of light the star emits. When you look at a bright light, your eyes respond to the visual wavelength photons falling on your eye's retina. The apparent brightness you perceive is related to the flux of energy entering your eye. Flux is defined as the energy in joules per second falling on one square meter. So one joule per second is one watt, a common unit of energy consumption used, for example, to rate light bulbs. The apparent brightness of a light source is determined by the inverse square law. So here is exactly what I showed you in an explanation on the whiteboard is the inverse square law. So one over R squared. So here we can see if we are at distance one away, it's at its brightness. So if we are at two R, it's a quarter, three R and nine for 16, so 25th, 36th, 49th, 64th, and it continues on. So the further we are away from an object, the less flux we will perceive from the object. So here is a better explanation of it. So here we can see we are at distance r away. And most of the light beams, for example, for imaginary light beams crosses the area. If we are 2r away, so that is a quarter. And 3r away, that is the ninth that will cross. So does this make it a little bit more clear? Awesome. So you can see that if you know both the apparent magnitude of a star, so pressing the flux received on Earth from it and its distance, you can use the inverse square law to correct for distance and learn the intrinsic brightness of the star. Astronomers do that using a special kind of magnitude scale described in the next section. And that is the absolute visual magnitude. If all stars were the same distance from Earth, you could compare one with one another and easily determine which was emitting more light and which less. Of course, the stars are scattered at different distances and you can't shove them around to line them up for comparison. If, however, you know the distance to a star, you can use the inverse square relation to calculate the brightness of the star would have at some standard distance. Astronomers have adopted 10 parsecs as the standard distance and referred to the absolute visual magnitude of a star as the apparent visual magnitude it would have if it were 10 parsecs away. To find a star's absolute visual magnitude, you begin by measuring its apparent visual magnitude, in other words, its brightness. A relatively easy task. Then you need the distance to the star. 
If the star is nearby, you can measure its parallax and from that calculate the distance. Once you know the distance, you can use a simple formula to correct the apparent visual magnitude for the distance and find its absolute visual magnitude. So always remember the difference between apparent visual magnitude and absolute visual magnitude. So a question. So does the inverse square law also relate to how light is transmitted from the sun if we can ignore the effect of the fraction of visible light? Yes, that is one of the contributing factors. So reasoning with numbers, this is another calculation I might ask in the test or the exam. So looks, but absolute visual magnitude tells you how luminous the star really is. The absolute visual magnitude of a star is the apparent visual magnitude of a star would have if it were 10 parsecs away. If you know a star's apparent visual magnitude and its distance, you can calculate its absolute visual magnitude, the magnitude distance formula that allows this calculation relates apparent visual magnitude distance in parsecs and absolute visual magnitude. So this is another formula you guys should know. So like I said in the beginning of this chapter, there's about five formulas we need to know for this module. And this is one of them. So the expression log means logarithmic to base 10. Sometimes it is convenient to rearrange the equation and write it in the following form. So it is the same question. So you can use whichever form is most convenient in a given problem. If you know the distance, the first form of the equation is convenient. But if you're trying to find the distance, the second form of the equation is best. So let's do an example. So Famous star Polaris is 133 parsecs from Earth and has an apparent magnitude of 2. So what is the absolute visual magnitude? So a solution, we take the first equation, we plug in our numbers and we now need to solve for the absolute visual magnitude. So solving for the absolute visual magnitude tells that the absolute visual magnitude of Polaris is minus 3.6. So if it were only 10 parsecs from Earth, it would dominate the night sky and be a very luminous object. Everybody happy with this? Awesome. So how does the sun stack up against other stars? The sun is, is tremendously bright in the sky, but it is also very nearby. Its absolute visual magnitude is just 14.8. So if the sun were only 10 parsecs from Earth, so about 33 light years, so not a great distance of astronomy, it would look no brighter than the faintest star in the handle of the Little Dipper. And this means if our sun were 10 parsecs away from Earth, we wouldn't be able to see it with our naked eyes because the limit of our naked eyes is 6, magnitude 6. But if it were 10 parsecs away, it is magnitude 14.8. So that is something for you guys to ponder and think about. So to put this in a little bit of perspective, if we put our wonderful sun 10 parsecs away, it would be fainter than these stars over here looking through a telescope. So the intrinsic brightness, stars known have absolute visual magnitudes of about 28.3, which means such a star, 10 parsecs from Earth, would be more than 25 times as bright as Venus at its brightest. 
Such stars have intrinsic brightness, 30 magnitudes brighter than the sun, which means they are emitting over 100,000 times more light than the sun. In contrast, the intrinsically faintest stars have absolute visual magnitudes of about 16 or fainter. So they are 11 magnitudes fainter than the sun, meaning they are emitting 25,000 times less light at visible wavelengths than the sun. So before we begin with luminosity, would you guys like to take a five minute break? Okay, let's take a five minute break and we will continue this lecture at 10 to 7. A question out of curiosity, sir, where was this formula derived from? So the one to get the absolute visual magnitude. So that is derived from just basic logarithms, if you know the different definitions. Okay, so let's continue on with the lecture. So now we're going to talk about the luminosity of stars. So the luminous, luminosity of a star is the total energy the star radiates in one second. So hot stars emit a great deal of ultraviolet light that you can't see, and cool stars emit mostly infrared light. 
absolute visual magnitude includes only visible radiation. So astronomers must make a correction, sometimes quite large, to account for the invisible energy. Then they can calculate the total luminosity of the star from its absolute magnitude. The astronomers often express luminosities in solar units, meaning that they write 2.5, so this symbol right here is the solar luminosity to represent the star that has 2.5 times the luminosity of the sun. To find the luminosity of a star in joules per second, you can just simply multiply by the luminosity of the sun in those units. So famous star Aldebaran has a luminosity of about 425 solar luminosity, which corresponds to about 6.5 times 10 to about 28 joules per second. The most luminous stars emit at least a billion times more energy per second than the least luminous. Clearly, the family of stars contains some interesting characters. So here we can see observations of spectral lines, give you information about what types of atoms are in atmospheres of the sun, planets and stars. So this is now we're looking at stellar spectra. So here we can see how uh, emission spectrum would look like. So here we can see hydrogen alpha, helium, oxygen three, nitrogen, and this is how we would interpret a spectrum. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, when astronomers were making the first careful studies of stellar spectra, the big differences observed between spectra of different stars were through to show that stars have a wide range of compositions. In the 1920s, Cecilia Payne made use of information from the atomic physics and the new field of quantum mechanics to reinterpret the spectra of stars. Payne's calculations show that over 90% of the atoms in the sun and other stars must be hydrogen, and most of the rest are helium. Payne discovered that one, the chemical composition of the sun is like the composition of other stars. Secondly, Spectra usually provide information mostly about the temperatures of stars. And thirdly, stars with similar spectra must have similar temperatures. One of the main methods Spain first developed for using spectra to determine its star temperatures is now called the Balmer thermometer. Recall that astronomers use the Kelvin temperature scale when referring to stellar temperatures. These temperatures range from 2,300 Kelvin to about 50,000 Kelvin. Compare these extremes with the surface temperature of the sun, which is 5,800 Kelvin. From the information about black body radiation in Venus law, you already know how to estimate the star's temperature by using its color. But the spectral lines of hydrogen at wavelengths visible to the human eye, called the Bulmer lines, combined with a few other spectral lines, give you much greater precision in estimating stellar temperatures. The Bulmer thermometer works because the strength of the Bulmer lines depends on the temperature of the star's surface layers. Both hot and cool stars have weak Bulmer lines, but medium temperature stars have strong Bulmer lines. That is because the Balmer absorption lines are produced only by atoms with electrons in a second energy level. So here we can see hydrogen Balmer lines are strongest for medium temperature stars, but with photospheres of about 10,000 Kelvin. So here we can see the temperature scale. So here at 10,000 Kelvin, the lines are the strongest. So lines of ionized calcium are strongest at lower temperatures than the hydrogen Balmer lines. So if we see peaks of ionized calcium, that means there are lower temperature stars. And then the spectral lines of each atom, ion or molecule are strongest at a particular temperature. And that gives us a better way to determining the temperature of certain stars. 
So during the 1890s, astronomers at Arvik Observatory invented a first widely used system for classifying stellar spectra. One of those scientists, Annie J. Cannon, personally inspected the spectra of over 250,000 stars. Spectra were first classified into groups labeled A through Q, but some of those groups were later dropped, merged with others, or reordered. The final classification scheme includes seven major temperature spectral classes or types still used today. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Do you guys still remember the little rhyme how to remember these? So this is quite easy to remember. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M is O, B, A, fine, girl, kiss, me. Or O, B, A, fine, guy, kiss, me. So that is just one way to remember these letters. So during the sequence of spectral types, called the spectral sequence, is a temperature sequence. The O stars are the hottest, and the temperature decreases along the sequence to M stars. The coolest. For better definition, astronomers divide each spectral class into 10 subclasses, for example. Spectral class A consists of subclasses A0 to A9. Next come F0 to F9, and so on. This final division gives a star's temperature to precision of about 5%. The sun, for example, is not just the G star, but the G2 star. So here we can see spectral class O stars is about 40,000 Kelvin. It is weak bulma lines. Other spectral features, it has ionized helium. And the naked eye example is, we can see the naked eye is... Orionis, and that is a O8 type star. Something interesting for everyone, should we know these temperatures? No, you shouldn't know these temperatures. If you wouldn't do something at this exam, I will give you the temperature. But it's just to show the different classification of temperature and how we determine them and how it compares to other stars. And again, for those that are Star Trek fans, you will realize that I use this classification in Star Trek. So they were saying we are approaching a G3 type star, or we are approaching a K type star. And now you know where this comes from and why Star Trek is one of the more scientifically accurate sci-fi series. So why did I do it in that order? I still need to sing the alphabet song to remember the alphabet. Now I have to know this. <laughs> so that's just how I classified it back in the day. So here we can see color photographs of stellar spectra ranging from O hot stars at the top to cool M stars at the bottom. The hydrogen Bowman lines are strongest as spectral type A0, but the two closely spaced lines of sodium in the yellow are strongest for very cool stars. Helium lines appear only in the spectra of the hottest stars. So notice that a helium line visible in the top spectrum has nearly but not exactly the same wavelength as the sodium lines visible in the cooler stars. Bands produced by the molecule titanium oxide are strong in spectra of the coolest stars. So here we can see examples of the spectra of different type class stars. So how would it actually look like? So spectra often represented as graph of intensity versus wavelength, with dark absorption lines appearing as sharp dips in curves. The set of spectra displays hot stars at the top and cool stars at the bottom. Hydrogen Bulma lines are strongest as spectral type A0, whereas lines of ionized calcium are strongest in K stars. Titanium oxide bands are strongest in M stars. Compare these spectra with the information in the previous figures. So question, are the slides loading for everyone? Uh, can anybody see the slides? Okay.
So now you can learn something new about some of the famous stars Sirius, the most bright sky in the brightest sky in the southern hemisphere. And that is a zero star. And Vega, bright overhead in the summer sky, is a zero star. They have nearly the same temperature and color, but both have strong Goldman ions in their spectra. The bright red star in Orion is Betelgeuse, a cool M2 star, but blue white Rigel is a hot B8 star. Polaris, the North Star, is an F8 star, a bit colder than our Sun. In Alpha Centauri, the closest star to the Sun is a G2 star, just like our own Sun. Now the study of spectral types is more than a century old, but astronomers continue to discover and define new types. The L dwarfs found in 1998 are cooler and fainter than M stars. They are understood to be objects smaller than stars but larger than planets and called brown dwarfs, which you will learn more about in a later chapter. The spectra of M stars contain bands produced by metal oxides such as titanium oxide. But L dwarf spectra contain bands produced by molecules such as iron, iron hydrate. So the T dwarfs are even cooler and fainter type of brown dwarf than L dwarfs. Their spectra show absorption by methane and water vapor. In 2011, astronomers using infrared space telescopes, large ground-based telescopes and highly sensitive infrared detectors discovered a class of objects with temperatures below 500 Kelvin, and they are labeled white dwarfs. So here we can see these six infrared spectra show difference between L dwarfs and T dwarfs in spectra of M stars. And the bottom of, and that shows titanium oxide, but the L and T dwarfs are so cool that other molecules such as iron hydride, water and methane dominate the spectra. So here we can see absorption by iron hydride is strong in L dwarfs. Water vapor absorption bands are very strong in cooler stars, and here absorption by methane is strong in T dwarfs. So now we're going to start looking at star sizes. So from this, how do we actually get the size of a star? So now that you know the luminosities of stars, you are ready to find their sizes. Usually expressed as radii or diameters. Recall that astronomers can't see stars as disks through astronomical telescopes. Diameters of a few stars have been measured and surface features on very small number of stars, including the famous star Betelgeuse, have been astonished distinguished using the technique of interferometry. But essentially all stars look like points of light, no matter how big the telescope. Nevertheless, there is a straightforward way to find the sizes of stars. If you know a star's temperature and luminosity, you can determine its radius. That relationship will introduce you to the most important diagram in astronomy, which sorts stars by temperature, luminosity and size. And in later chapters will help you learn about the life cycle of stars. So here we can see another example. So here we can see, so for interesting sake, did you guys know, or let me ask you rather, what is the name of our own sun? Yes, that is so. And, uh, where does that name come from? Not Greek God, that actually came from Latin. And Latin that was again translated into um, Italian, Spanish, French, and most of the derivative is soul. So soul is our own sun. And if you speak about our own solar system, it is the soul system. So here we can see, so, so I have to ask, where does the name Betelgeuse come from? I have no idea where the name Betelgeuse comes from, but that would be something interesting to read up about. So here we can see from of our different sizes of stars that we can see. 
So to use the luminosity and temperature of a star to find its size, you first need to understand the two factors that affect a star's luminosity, surface area and temperature. You can eat dinner by candlelight because a candle flame has a small surface area. Although the flame is very hot, it cannot radiate much heat. It has a low luminosity. However, if the candle flame were 12 foot tall, it would have a very large surface area from which to radiate. And although it might be no hotter than normal candle flame, its luminosity would drive you from the table. So here we can see the luminosity radius and temperature. So, molten lava pouring from a volcano is not as hot as a candle flame, but lava flow has more surface area and radiates more energy than a candle flame. Approaching a lava flow without protective gear is dangerous. Have you guys realized it? That a can candle flame is hotter than lava. In a similar way, a hot star may not be very luminous if it has a small surface area, but it could be highly luminous if it were larger and had a larger surface area from which to radiate. On the other hand, even a cool star could be luminous if it had a large surface area. Because of this dependence on both temperature and surface area, you need to separate their effects to find the sizes of stars. The Hertzsprung Russell, or in short HR diagrams, named after its originators, Netherlands astronomers Ejna Hertzsprung and US astronomer Henry Norris Russell, is a graph that separates the effects of temperature and surface area on stellar luminosities and enables astronomers to sort and classify stars according to their sizes. So here we can see an example of it. So here we can use, before we go into the proper HR diagram, we can use an example of racing cars. So you could analyze automobiles by plotting their horsepower versus their weight and this reveal relationships between various models. So most would lie somewhere along the main sequence of normal cars, but here we can have racing cars, sports cars, and economy models. In a HR diagram, the location of a point tells you a great deal about the stars it represents. Points near the top of the diagram represents very luminous stars, and points near the bottom represents very low luminosity stars. Points near the right edge of the diagram represents very cool stars, and points near the left edge of the diagram represents very hot stars. So here we can see in a HR diagram, a star is represented by a dot at a position that shows the star's luminosity and temperature. The background color in this diagram indicates the temperature of the stars. The sun is a yellow white G2 star. Most stars, including the sun, have properties along the main sequence strip running from hot high luminosity stars at upper left to cool low luminosity stars at lower right. So here we can see the more luminous stars are plotted towards the top of the HR diagram, hotter stars are blue and light to the left, cooler stars are red and light to the right, and fainter stars are plotted as points near the bottom. So this is probably the most important figure or diagram in astronomy. Do you guys, are you guys still following, happy with this? Awesome. So now we're going to start looking at star sizes. So giants, super giants, super giants and dwarfs. So the main sequence is the region of the HR diagram running from the upper left to lower right corners. It indicates roughly, includes roughly 80% of all stars. As you might expect, the hot main sequence stars are more luminous than the cool main sequence stars. Notice in the HR diagram that some cool stars lie above the main sequence. Although they are cool, they are luminous. 
That must mean they are large and have more surface area than the main sequence stars of the same temperature. These are called giant stars and they are roughly 10 to 100 times larger than the sun. There are supergiant stars at the top of the HR diagram that are over a thousand times the sun's diameter. At the bottom of the HR diagram lie the economy models, stars that are very low in luminosity because they are very small. At the bottom end of the main sequence, the red dwarfs are not only small, they are also cool and gives them low luminosities. In contrast, the white dwarfs lie in the lower left of the HR diagram and are lower in luminosity than you would expect. Given their high temperatures, that must mean they are very small, although some white dwarfs are among the hottest stars known. They are so small they have very little surface area from which to radiate, and that limits them to low luminosities. So here is another example that I might ask in the testing exam. So let's go through it. So the luminosity L of a star depends on two things, its size and its temperature. If the star has a large surface area from which to radiate, it can have high luminosity. So recall from the discussion of blackbody radiation and reasoning of number 6.1, that the amount of energy emitted per second from each square meter of the star's surface is omega t to the power 4. This, the star's luminosity, can be written as its surface area in square meters times the amount of the amount that radiates from each square meter. So here we can now the luminosity equals the surface area times omega t for temperature to the power 4. Because a star is a sphere, you can use the formula surface area, so 4 pi r squared, and plug it into equation. Then the luminosity equals 4 pi r squared omega t to the power 4. This it may seem complicated, but if you express luminosity, radius, and temperature in proportion to the sun, you get a simpler form. So here we have the luminosity of whatever we are investigating. Here we have the luminosity of the sun, the radius of the sun, and the temperature of the sun. So let's go through an example. So suppose a star has 10 times the sun's radius, but only half the temperature. How luminous would it be? So we plug it in. So here we plug in, so this is one. Temperature is two, plug in 10, plug in one. So that means it is 6.25. So this the star is 6.25 times the luminosity of the sun. So you can also use the formula to find the sizes of stars. So let's go through that example. So suppose you measure the apparent brightness and parallax of a star and thereby determine its intrinsic brightness. The star spectrum shows its surface is two times hotter than sun's surface. That allows you to correct the intrinsic brightness to include the non-visible radiation. So you can calculate that its total luminosity is 40 solar lumini. What is the radius of the star relative to the sun's radius? So, knowing the star's luminosity and temperature, you can find its radius. So here we plug in a 40, we know the sun's luminosity is 1. We have R, we have R is the solar radii, and we plug in our temperatures. And now we solve for this relationship, and then we solve for the relationship further. So the star is 60% larger in radius than the sun. So that's easy, plug and play. You guys happy with this explanation? Awesome. So the equation of reasoning with numbers 8.3 that relates luminosity, temperature, and radius of a star can be used to draw precise lines of constant radius across the HR diagram. And these lines slope down to the right across the diagram because cooler stars are fainter than hotter stars of the same size. So now here yeah, we can get a better indication of our HR diagram. So here we can see our main line. So here we can see is stars that has one solar radii is here is our sun. So here we can see 0 0.001 solar radar. Here we can see 10 solar radar. Here we can see a thousand solar radar. So here we can see a bit more how 
size, luminosity, and temperature fit together. So the previous figure plots the luminosities and temperatures of a number of well-known stars, along with lines of constant radius. For example, located a la line labeled one solar radius. Notice that it passes through the point representing the sun. Any stars whose point is located along this line has a size equal to the sun's. Next, look at the rest of the stars along the main sequence. They range from 10th the size of the sun to about 10 times as large. Even though the main sequence slopes dramatically down to the right across the diagram, most main sequence stars are similar in size. In contrast, the white dwarfs at the lower left of the diagram are extremely small, so only a hundredth the diameter of the sun, about the size of Earth. And the giants and supergiants at the upper right are extremely large compared to the stars in the main sequence. So going back, so any star on this line will have the size of one solar radius. Anyone on this line, 10 solar radius. Every star on this line, 0 0.01 solar radius. Everyone's still following. Okay. So notice the great ranges of sizes among stars. The largest stars are 100,000 times larger than the tiny wolf, white wolves. If the sun were a tennis ball, the white wolves would be grains of sand, and the largest supergiants would be as big as football fields. So, question, so a solar radius is the radius of our own sun. Yes, that's exactly it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I see it's almost 20 past seven. So let's call it for this evening. I will see you all in next week's class. So I know this was a lot to take in for this lecture. So if you have any more questions, you're more than welcome to contact me. I will remain active for another minute or two if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, you are more than welcome to log off and have a great week. Remember to do the quiz before next week. Monday and don't underestimate your moon project. Have a great evening everyone. So a question, do I believe in negative mass? So I still need to see evidence for negative mass. Yes, that is true. So string theory would be do wonders for the world, but we still need to prove string theory. Uh, yes, but that is something interesting. So, sir, which chapters will be covered in quiz, or is it everything we have done this far? So everything we've done this for this lecture of tonight not included. So, from Mr. Melville, you think we'll ever get to that? I personally think we will eventually.
that will be great. So if there's no further questions, everyone, then I will also log off. So have a wonderful evening and I will see you all in next week's class. Good luck with the rest of the week.